Hello, my name is Dr. Shadai Tembo, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I'm a lecturer in early childhood studies at Bath Spa University and an associate lecturer at the Open University. I'm a trustee for the Fatherhood Institute and also an independent writer and consultant for critical early years. Now, throughout this series, we'll be exploring representation in the early years, inspiring you with guidance on ways to be more inclusive in your practice. And I'm delighted to introduce Laura Henry Elaine, MBE, as today's guest. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. How are you today? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. And how are you, Shadai? Yes, I'm well, thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to have you on this podcast today. Now, before we get into the content of inclusive practice, I think listeners will be really interested to hear a bit about you, who you are and your background into and around the early years field. Okay, I'll try to be as brief as possible. (laughs) Um, I left school at 16 with hardly any qualifications because I'm dyslexic and the listeners will probably pick up in some of my pronunciation, how I pronounce certain words, Mm -hmm. um, my grammar, my spelling, my handwriting. Thank goodness that I can, you know, type now and not have to write when I was in school, secondary school, and I did a two-week placement in a day nursery. And I thought I loved connecting with the children and the families, and it was then a social services day nursery. And I was, I believe I was in the toddler room. I even remember the activity that I was doing. It was string painting that I had to do. (laughs) And I took back the children's artwork, and we had to present it as, you know, when we went back into school after the two weeks. So my local college, Paddington, I applied. It's heavily oversubscribed. And I got in, and I just thought, wow, I didn't have the qualifications. And I remember we did a a group interview and I think I must have talked about that placement it must have been something I said about the children and their families and I got in and I became the most studious person ever I just I found who I needed to be mm-hmm. <laughs> within early years education and I even remember the first day the lecturer um, Val Jackson she was an ex-teacher And she said, you know, never call a child naughty and always get down to their children's physical and emotional level. And and Sylvia Donovan, who was a health visitor um, background, and I loved it. We did sewing, needle, um, sewing and needlework, cooking, um, science and woodwork. And we had to do 60 observations, different placements. I was at Great Ormond Street, was a nanny, day nursery nursery class at this reception special needs school very robust qualification um and then i i left did agency work for a while worked in london borough of camden equivalent to a children's center and camden was one of the first local authorities that integrated education with social services so we had a, a teacher on site um became the deputy very quickly then a manager, then I had my two children, took some time out, then I went back and I worked with the health visitors as a community nursery nurse, weighing babies in clinics. I became a baby massage therapist, um, loved connecting with parents, supporting them with, you know, any issues they had with their children. Then I was lecturing part-time, went to work in London Borough of Southwark as a registration inspection officer, so inspecting nursery schools, registering, training, and then Ofsted came in. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That was in September 2001, and I just thought, Ofsted's not for me. Not today, Ofsted. (laughs) So Mm. I lasted, I think, two years in Ofsted, and I just thought, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I know there's lots of if off those need to reform and that's another podcast for another day <laughs> but I agree with we do need to safeguard children but there must be another way that we can we can actually do it and then left Ofsted went then to work with um Electra and then a colleague said to me could I come in and do some training in a local authority on um, getting ready for inspection and I said oh, okay then I'll do it and then it snowballed from that different local authorities, nursery world asked me to write a series of articles. Mm. And I'm dyslexic. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to go. And then I, I think I've written for every single education publication, started to go overseas. And then by default was working with a production company. I've got an idea. But then I had written the Jojo and Grand Grand books, 
connected with the BBC. They said no, um, I think three or four times. And then Jojo and Dan Brown got a yes. And then the last three years, Jojo has been shown globally across different countries. Um, I've written My Skin, Your Skin. I've got another book coming out in October, My Family, Your Family. And I've got another book next year. But I, for the listeners, I still do early years work. Yeah. Because that's my home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I still go into um, nurseries and schools doing advisory work, training. So yeah. I just feel that early years, you know, coming up to, I think, nearly 40 years. <laughs> I am old listeners. <laughs> that I've had the privilege, I would say I'm privileged, to work with children and, and their families. And it must go into the thousands now. Mm, it's a fascinating career you've had, Laura. And I'm, I'm thinking back to my own first experience in a nursery setting. I think that's, that's very foundational for a lot of people. And it's great to hear your experiences there. I guess I'm thinking back to your early educational experiences too, uh, being dyslexic and what that was like in a schooling environment and how that feeds into your passion for inclusion, uh, which has been a theme throughout your work, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think I'm always championing, championing, as again, dyslexic, <laughs> slip mm -hmm. over there. I champion in, you know, when I see the inclusion, where I see things, quote unquote, bad practice, mm -hmm. where I see somebody not being treated fairly. And my oldest son, for the, the listeners, who's 29 now, he's autistic. And I had to battle for the correct, you know, what for a better word, for his education, for his care, for the social care that he needed as, as a young adult. And I still have to be his voice and his, and, and be an advocate for him. And so where I see it, if I'm in a school or in, or in a nursery, it's very difficult for me to keep quiet mm. <laughs> because I can see it and I can see what's going on and I can see there may be a slight injustice and coupled with the fact if we're talking from an, an intersectionality point of view you know being black female with a learning challenge hello mm. that's that's quite a lot to to carry and when I and when I do point it out when I'm working with a company they've asked me to do a check on a book or it's a tv show and I say well actually this term <laughs> This particular image, it's offensive because, and there's a reason why. And then I would go back and I would share, you know, research or an article that backs up why I, what I'm saying and why it is a no-no. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I was doing some training and I talked about, you know, a lot of individuals still use the term sort of, they, you know, I treat everybody the same. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't see colour. Mm. I don't see colour. And then when I explain it, if I'm doing a keynote or a training session, I say, I can see it's coming from a good place. But you say in that, you don't see me then mm. as a black person. And I give a variety of examples yeah. as the reason why you can't, you shouldn't say that. And then interestingly enough, in the coffee lunch break, I have delegates coming to me and some of these, you know, they're teachers teaching young children or they're training, mm -hmm. you know, people to go into the profession. They say, oh, my goodness me, Laura, I didn't realise that I thought I was saying it from a point of kindness. And that's why podcasts like this mm -hmm. are important because it's about education and I'm learning every single day. I haven't stopped learning with regards to inclusion and diversity and race and racism and anti-blackness and LGBTQ plus issues and the gypsy, the Romeo, the traveling community. All of these things I'm always leaning in and we can never stop learning. So for those colleagues who come to me, they, they have a light bulb moment and they say, oh my God, I got it wrong, I got it wrong. I always used to say that we treat everybody the same. And I just say, well, that's, you know, that's why I'm here, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think when I did deliver training as well, seeing colleagues have those light bulb moments and kind of change that, that thought process is so important and then go off and make that important impact within their practice. I just want to get your take, really, given how, how long you've been in, in and around the early years fields. 
How much has it changed with regard to inclusion in your view? Has things, to what extent things got better? And um, how, how far do we still have to go in terms of inclusive practice? You know, that's a great question because if I think back to the 80s and mm. the early 90s, it was pretty non-existent. And the training, although, you know, I shout from the rooftop about the NNEB, it did lack that element of the diversity, the inclusion talking about racism and when it was and I used to remember going on training whether or not it was with the local authority or when I worked in the health sector and you'd be on a course and it was all about raising awareness for example this is what the Jewish community are learning this is if you are black if you are a Rastafarian this is what you are like if you are a Muslim this is what you were like. <laughs> it was that type of training and it didn't go into the finer details because we are all unique. You know, you and I, we're both black, but, you know, and I start off my skin, your skin, like that in the book. We are both black. We both wear glasses. Mm. You know, there's gender <laughs> issues, but we're different. So that was a type of training yeah. that we that I used to sit through. And even then I used to think this is a little bit uncomfortable. But actually to give Ofsted the due, the long six, so I think nine months that I was working in Ofsted, I was given an additional role in working in diversity and inclusion. And I connected with Jane Lane. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. Jane Lane and other colleagues. And we used to have meetings and conferences. And I do remember there was a, a professor come over from France and he was given a, a keynote and he was just saying how inappropriate that type of training is. And another colleague then mentioned that actually in the East End, because again, it was very stereotypical training that people thought was correct, women from the Bangladeshi community in the East End of London were held back because the, the thought was they just stayed at home cooking. <laughs> so they didn't, you know, so any opportunities in terms of um, working, you know, work opportunities, educational opportunities, they weren't targeted because they just stay at home. So that's the danger then mm. of stereotypes and when people think and do training that way. Yeah. So I just think that was the type of training. And then I think slowly but surely we got a, a little bit better. And then I believe, you know, from the last three years, I would say from Black Lives Matter, there has been significant training. You know, we've got um, our dear colleague and friend, Liz Pemberton, and the Black Nursery Manager, who's just been doing some fantastic work um, locally, nationally and internationally. And I think more and more, you know, whether or not you're an early year setting or a school, the work you know, has been done, but I still feel now we do need to be more, to do more. We do need to do more. We're just getting started. And I just feel it's about having the conversation. Let's have a conversation about this. What does it mean in practice? And and it doesn't matter, I feel, if you're in a setting where you're 100% white, mm -hmm. um, you need this training more than anybody <laughs> Because it's about then, if you don't come into contact with anybody that's a different or an other, um, how are you, you meant to know? So I feel that the, the training, I believe, should be mandatory. And, um, and we should keep on having conversations, reflections to move it forward. So hopefully we don't have to have conversations in the future. And see, yes, we will still need it, but we, I won't be hearing on my travels where three year olds are saying, I don't like black men because they're robbers <laughs> or, yeah. or some an inappropriate comment about a child's hair. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating to hear about uh, how much it's changed since, since the eighties and nineties. But I think, as you say, we are still only at the start of this journey and there is a long, long way to go. You mentioned earlier about how you find it hard to keep quiet when you sense an injustice when you go into nursery settings. Um, so do I, to an extent nowadays. I, you know, I feel like there's a real need to speak up. But I know for a lot of practitioners that can be more difficult. Um, they want to say something, but they're a bit anxious or they're, they're not sure how to speak up and raise issues around inclusive practice and inclusion. What advice would you give to those practitioners? One thing I think that's super important is for nurseries and schools and preschools, wherever you 
work listening to this is that they start with their their values mm -hmm. so i think that's super important and what the organizational behavior looks like in practice and that culture so do we have a culture where we are able to speak without fear or favor and where we are listened to and this is why it's important to have one-on-one -on -one supervision why it is important to have regular staff meetings and have discussions about issues that matter and i think it, that actually comes from the senior leadership team guiding those conversations that might be uncomfortable i know the cliche says mm. we have to become uncomfortable to be comfortable but i think that's right because i think if you are if we are talking about you know race and racism if you don't feel uncomfortable if you don't feel oh my goodness me how am i going to make a difference then um we are actually doing something right and it's not about i think making people feel guilty oh my goodness me i'm white and this is terrible what my ancestors have done mm. but it's about saying actually what am i going to do about it now that i know this information what further reading am i going to to do what changes am i going to make to my practice that has an impact on children so children are able to come away and say and pick up when an injustice has happened. Because children, I always say when someone said to me, but should we be having conversations with children about race and racism in their early years? And I said, yes, if children can experience it, if we can talk to children about yeah. climate change, look at the summer we're having now. Mm -hmm. We can talk to children about recycling, about waste, about not leaving the taps running as they're washing their hands. Why can't we have a conversation with them about race and racism? Yeah. Because they would be able to um, to understand. And I know that from my travels yeah. and having conversations with children. We talk to them about bullying. We mm. talk to them about, you know, not running and, and their mm. feelings. And we have discussions about neuroscience and all these things. Why can't we have a conversation? What mm. are we frightened about? When we shouldn't be frightened, you know? Absolutely. And we'll, we'll come on to discuss anti-racism in more depth in the second episode. But I think what you're saying about that uncomfortability is, is really quite important. Ultimately, any uncomfortable things that we have kind of pale in comparison to the experience of racism that you know, black and minoritized children themselves will be facing. So we need to get over that uncomfortability as, as soon as possible, really, to face those inequalities that the young children are having. Also, some really important takeaways that you mentioned there in terms of looking at the values of the, the setting, thinking about the culture and ensuring that comes from the leadership team as well. So that's a great place to end this episode. Thank you very much, Laura. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Laura, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Shadai Tembo, and Laura Hemi Elaine, MBE. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your settings and links to relevant resources.